Welcome to the Daily Growth Book Overview of Mark Chapter 6. We're going to go ahead and dive in to Mark Chapter 6, and it starts off with a really interesting story. Um, Jesus is going back to his hometown, the place he grew up, and people, there's a buzz there, but it's not a good buzz. They're talking about Jesus in a really negative way. This is what they're saying. Where did he get all this wisdom and, and the power to perform such miracles? They scoffed. So they didn't look at Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, the healer, the deliverer. They were actually trying to downplay his life. And they began to say stuff like this. He's just a carpenter. But could it be that we today are trying to downplay Jesus Christ ourselves and making him less than he truly is? And there were some repercussions for these decisions and these conversations. We need to be very careful what we're saying about our lives and even self-talk. Could we be talking ourselves out of miracles and breakthroughs? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's really true. But let's see what happened as a result of their unbelief and just their conversations. In this city, there were people that were sick. They were demon-possessed. They were dealing with hopeless situations. But something didn't happen in this city, even though the Savior of the world, God Almighty in the flesh was there. They didn't get breakthroughs. Look at this. And it says in verse in verse five, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. There's, this is a, there's only a few times where Jesus is amazed. And this is one of them. He was amazed at their unbelief. We see in this when he was talking about the centurion that had great faith and he said, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say it. And my, and my servant will be healed. And he was amazed at his faith. So he was amazed at his faith and he was amazed at their unbelief. And this is what happened. He could only heal a few. Now, if nowadays, if a few get healed, we'll celebrate like, whoa, it's a revival. But Jesus, I want you to understand this. He'd go in the cities and heal everyone. So what, what happened? Unbelief can stop a move of God in your life. We want to make sure that we're not talking ourselves out of a miracle. Now we go on and we see Jesus um, send out his disciples. He's been training them for a while now. And now he's sending them out to do what he did. He's already showed them. This is what we do. We teach the word. We preach the word. But then there's going to be signs and wonders following. I'm going to give you my authority. Think about that. Jesus has given them his authority to what? cast out demons, heal the sick, and preach his message. Jesus has done the same thing with everything, every single one of us. In the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in, in heaven and earth. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Or, or he said, go and preach the gospel. And then he talks about signs and wonders following them. Let's see the instructions that he gives these disciples. And he, he called his 12 disciples together. And, be, and this is in verse seven of chapter six. And he, his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two. Let's look at these instructions. Giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He, all, he, he allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Wow. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's taken away all excuses. Could it be that we're trying to overprepare for what God has called us to do? Jesus set this up. All you need is my message and the authority I'm giving you. I'm telling you, go and preach the gospel. Go and cast out demons. Go and heal. But I don't want you to take anything with you. Not even extra food. No extra clothes. Just a little walking stick. I'll let you take some sandals. But that's it. No two pairs of two pairs of shoes. Now, I remember when God called us, you know, to my, me and my wife to start this church. It was something similar, not as, as severe as this. But he asked me to leave my 14 year career where I was making right around two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Just bought my house. Things were going great. 
and he says, I want you to right now become a full-time pastor. The church had no money at all. There, there was no, I have five girls. I don't see a way that, there is really no way that, that my family's needs could be met. But this is what I had to do. I had to do exactly what Jesus did. And he told the, he told the disciples to do. Just go out. I'll supply your need. This is what I've learned. When you say yes to the call, there's someone else saying yes to supporting the call. And until you say yes, they're waiting. They're waiting. The support's there. But you'll never walk on water till you step out of the boat. And that's the reality. So now we see the disciples, they go out there and this is what happens. The disciples went out telling everyone they met is verse 12. They met to repent of their sins and turn to God and they cast out many demons and heal many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. There's instructions here on ministry. And I just believe that maybe we've gotten away from these simple instructions, sending them out two by two, just two people agreeing. There's power in that. But God's spirit will move. And then we preach a message. What was their message? Repent of your sins. We need to bring back that old message. I mean, it's real. Repent of your sins. It's almost like we're scared to tell people they're sinners. But the reality is, unless we let they know they're sinners, they can't turn to Jesus. This is how you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is how you get saved. You turn from your sin, then you turn to Jesus. Then you're forgiven of your sins, filled with the Holy Spirit, and you become a child of God. That's how it happens. So today, maybe that's you. And you say, man, I need to repent of my sins. Let's do it today. Repent of your sins and turn to Jesus. And do not be scared to tell sinners. Now, we're not sending a judgment away, but let them know that is a sin. And if you repent of that sin, you can be forgiven and set free and healed. First repentance, preaching, then casting out demons, then healing the sick. This is all we need to do. Olive oil. They just put some oil in their hands <laughs> and laid it on them. So what is, was the olive oil like special? No, it was their obedience that was special. And if we just do the simple and we do the natural, God will do the supernatural. Now, this is what happens. Now, going deeper into this chapter, we it's, it's almost like Mark is now going into a story and he's going to a historical story about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, of course, was, a, um, the Bible says he was the greatest of all prophets because he was prophesying about Jesus. Um, a lot of people didn't like John the Baptist. Some people loved him, some didn't. Well, in this story, it talks about a woman that hated him. And John, the ba this is the reason she hated him. She hated him because he was exposing her sin. It was kind of like the, the disciples, repent, you're sinning. And some people accept and repent. Some people will hate you for letting them know that they're sinners. Well, she happened to hate them. This is what John was saying in verse 18. John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. Her name was Herodias. And so Herodias bore a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But without Herod's approval, she was powerless. Think about this. She's pre he's preaching and she's saying, I don't like you, but I don't like you to the point that I want to kill you. Whoa, that's hate. <laughs> so she was plain hate. So now she started scheming, finding a way to kill him. And what was what, what was the sin that she committed? Well, she was married to Herod's brother. And somehow now she's married, <laughs> married to the, 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 the king of the day. And, and, and John the Baptist saying, hey, that's a sin. Her, your, uh, your husband is still alive. What are you doing? And John the Baptist didn't really care what position they had. He was there to preach a sim simple message. Repent and then get baptized. That was his message. His message was real simple. They didn't like the message. Well, this is what happened. Uh, th there was a night where they had a special occasion and they had dancers that came out on this, this big festivity celebration dinner. And Herodias' daughter, daughter, her daughter, began. she was a dancer. And when Herod saw her dance, he goes, whoa. And I don't know if he was driven by lust, but after it was all said and done, after she danced, he said, look, girl, you dance so well. I'll give you anything you want, even up to half my kingdom. 
And he said it in front of everybody. What a dance this must have been. Or maybe Herod was just full of lust. <laughs> That's probably what happened. And when you're full of love, you, you say some silly stuff. And this is what happened. Herod, that young lady, Herodias' daughter, she went to mama. Mama, what should I ask for? She, and the mama said, I know what to ask for. Ask for John the Baptist's head. Now, Herod did respect it, even though John the Baptist was frank and straight and told him to repent, he still respected him. And it grieved him that he goes, oh, I should have never said it, but he said it. And he couldn't back up because he was a king. What you say goes. So what he had to do is back up his word. And when he sent his soldiers down to a prison where John the Baptist was, and they cut off his head and gave it to the young lady on a platter. And this is what this whole thing's about. You could go ahead and, and kill the messenger, but it doesn't kill the message. You're still responsible for what you heard. There's so many people nowadays that will try to downplay a preacher or, or someone that's sharing the good news and even discredit them. But the truth is, you could fight against the message all day long, but the message is still there and there still will be repercussions. Imagine this. There, these stories are written in the Bible forever, how they fought against the message of repentance. This message John the Baptist was preaching was not there to degrade them or hurt them. It was the purpose was to save them so they could receive eternal life. So we have to be very, very careful that when the word of God is being spoken, that we don't resist it. And then watch out that you don't become a hater of the messengers. Let's not be killers of the messengers because it does not destroy the message. You still will be held accountable. Now, we go on after this story, after John the Baptist. This, this chapter has so much stories and ideas and, 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 and wisdom in, the, in these stories. Now we go into Jesus um, and the apostles, go back to them. They returned from ministry, their ministry tour, and they told him everything they had done and taught. The disciples are excited. This is in verse 30. They're super excited and they're saying, man, the demons were cast out and people were healed and you gave us authority. We're so excited. And Jesus in another, uh, in another verse says this. He says, don't be so excited that demons are listening to you. Be really excited that your names are written in the book of life and that you're saved. That's the big deal. Let's make sure that we're not missing it. Let's make sure, of course, demons are going to be cast out. People are going to be healed. But the most important thing is that Jesus saved you. Let's not forget the biggest miracle of all, people being saved. That's the most important thing. But after all the ministry, Jesus says, let's go to a quiet place and let's rest a while. And this is really important for you to know. There's times where I'm running and doing a lot of ministry but if you don't balance your life out, you can get burned out. Make sure that you have times of rest. In those times of rest, what are you doing? Spending time with Jesus. And when you're spending time with Jesus, what is he doing? He's refilling your tank. He's re-energizing you. He's giving you ideas. He's giving you wisdom. So make sure that you spend time resting. Jesus did it with his disciples. Let's make sure we have times where we're running but rest as well as you run. Never feel guilty that you're taking some time to rest. It's very, very healthy, okay? So now, after their time of rest, you know what it's time? Ministry time. <laughs> it's time to go back to work. After the rest time, um, they, there's crowds waiting for them, and the crowds are waiting, and Jesus has compassion on them. This very, very important thing. In, in verse 34, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So Jesus was driven when he's doing ministry for his love for people. Isn't that awesome? He loved them. And he saw, man, they're like people that have no leadership. They're confused and I'm here to help them. I'm here to guide them. Never think that Jesus is looking at you judging you. He's looking at you and he sees your hurt. He sees your pain. And sometimes he sees our confusion that we don't even know what to do. We're like lost sheep with no leadership. He goes, I'd love to lead you. I'd love to help you. I'd love to help you overcome. I want to protect you. Will you allow Jesus to be your shepherd? He does love you 
and he doesn't want to help you. This is what happened. After a long day of teaching and ministry, uh, G, the, uh, it was getting late. And the disciples said, why don't we just send these people away um, so they could eat? Um, there's no food here. And then Jesus says something really wild. He says, you feed them. Feed thousands of people? How are we going to do that? And he says, just bring me what you have. And this is what they did. They, find five, they found five loaves of bread and two fish. And they put it back in Jesus' hands. Jesus blessed it, began to break it, sent it, put it right back in the disciples' hands. And he says, go feed them. And it multiplied. And they fed the 5,000. This is a story that we've heard a lot of. And it just reminds us that when we're out there doing the work of God, God will provide supernaturally for the work that he's called you to do. And there's nothing impossible for God. You know what you work with? With what you have. You bring God what you have and God does a miracle. And you might be saying, I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough ability. I don't have enough experience. I have some flaws in my life. And God says, that's okay. I'm just telling you, bring me what you have. When I bless it, they will see my supernatural hand on you. And this is what they'll know. It sure wasn't you. It, you must have God on your side. That's exactly right. But the Bible said that they ate until they were satisfied. 5,000 men and maybe another 10,000 people there, 15 to 25,000 people. And they ate until they were satisfied. There's one thing for sure. This world is looking for satisfaction. And it's only going to be found in Jesus Christ. The drinking can't satisfy us. The lust can't satisfy us. You could buy all the things that you want and won't satisfy you. You could climb the ladder in your, in, your, in your corporation. It won't satisfy you. You could buy the mansion on the hill. It's great to have those things. But once you think that those things can satisfy you, you're going to find yourself very disappointed because none of those things can satisfy you. There's only one that can satisfy you, and his name is Jesus Christ. They ate until they were satisfied. And maybe for the first time, maybe they were like, I'm really satisfied. It was, what, was it, what was it in that food or in that bread and that fish? Well, it was that Jesus touched it. Now we go into this final story where Jesus let's get, tells the disciples, let's get back into the boat, and we're going to travel to the other side of the lake again. And, but Jesus goes into the mountains to pray by himself. So the disciples are in a boat. It's late in the evening. They get in a the boat. They're ready to cross over and they begin their crossing over. They're rowing. This is a problem. It seems like every time they get in this boat, there's a storm. <laughs> again, there's a storm. It happened before. It's happening again. But while Jesus is praying, at three o'clock in the morning, now this is prayer. I, I don't think we could ignore that. Jesus is praying. If Jesus needs to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Now, don't make prayer spooky or religious. All prayer is this, communicating with God. We give God our concerns. We speak to God. And then you know what happens? God speaks to us. We empty ourselves. And that God fills us with his spirit. Now, Jesus was praying. And I don't know what exactly happened. I don't know if he got a word of knowledge or a vision. But somehow he could see the disciples miles and miles and miles away through the storm, the clouds, the rain, the waves. And he saw them struggling. And he starts walking towards them. And as he starts walking towards them, the scripture says something interesting. He was even thinking about passing them by. Now, why was he thinking about passing them by? Because he's the one that told them, let's go to the other side. And when God gives you a word, there might still be a storm, but you got to trust what God has said. If Jesus is giving you a word, just continue rowing. You will get to the other side. God's word will not fail. His word will not return empty. It will accomplish everything he said it would do. We need to learn how to persevere. And maybe Jesus was going to say, last time I saved you from the storm, this time you're going to roll yourself through the storm. Have you ever had to roll yourself through a storm? 
and you're using it and doing everything you got to get to get through it. I've been there. I remember when my daughter was sick in the hospital with cancer. I felt like I was rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and bad report after bad report after bad report. But this idea, God has said it. You're going to get to the other side. Don't you quit in the middle of your storm because you know what's going to happen? You'll drown out there. You keep rowing. But anyways, the disciples saw him <laughs> walking on water. So Jesus at least was walking close to them to let them know it's okay. And they called out to him. And oh, they were scared. They maybe thought it was a ghost. But Jesus said to them at once, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Maybe there's a word for you. Don't be afraid. I know you've got some bad reports. I Maybe it doesn't look real good. God said, don't be afraid. I am here. I've not left you. You're going to be okay. And this is what happened. And this is a, in verse 51. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed for they didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. This idea is that they didn't understand the miracle that who Jesus really was. They, they saw the miracle, but they missed it. They did, we serve a God that's, that does impossible. He could take nothing and create something magnificent with it. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Almighty God in the flesh. They missed the miracle. He, they saw a creative miracle. Who creates something out of nothing? Only God can do that. They missed it. Now he's walking on water. How is he walking on water and walking on the storm? Because he's the God of the universe. He created everything. He has authority over everything. They were amazed. And God is ready to amaze you. And no matter what storm that you're going through, get ready for God to show up. He sees your pain. He sees your hurt. And he's very compassionate. He loves you so much. Let's continue studying the book of Mark. We just concluded Mark chapter six. What a great chapter. You're going to get so much insight as you read verse by verse this coming week. God bless you. We love you. This is just time to grow. So let's grow together. Love you. God bless.